I want to open a passage of Scripture with you today from a, a, a portion of the Bible that we often talk about toward the end of our journey on life. But we don't often use it throughout life, unfortunately. But it is a power-packed chapter in the Bible that actually gives us great guidance for the start of our journey and for each step along the way, not just for the end at the funeral, you know? So the passage I'm talking about is Psalm 23. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open with me to Psalm 23. If you have your Bible on your handheld, turn it on. You know, you can go there with me. And let's look at the 23rd Psalm and look at, at what God has to share with us today. Now, we're, we know that this Psalm was written by King David, but we're not sure exactly when he wrote it. What we're sure of is that when he wrote it, he wrote it based on his own experience as a shepherd. So whether he was king when he wrote it or whether it was when he was a shepherd boy watching over the flocks on those hills of Palestine, maybe under the starry host of Bethlehem as he tended his sheep, he wrote this psalm thinking about God's care for him. Can you just picture it? I mean, here's a young boy. He's watching over his sheep, responsible for each one of them, and he's connecting how God cares for him and how he cares for us just like he cares for sheep. Now, I think the shepherd is a great metaphor for a mother, too. I mean, Mary had a little lamb, right? I heard Pastor John was talking last week about the lamb of God. There's another Mary that actually had a lamb, right? I think moms can really connect with this metaphor of shepherd as well, as well as fathers. You know, we've got both the nurturing heart of a mother expressed in a shepherd, and we have that fierce protector of a father expressed in a shepherd as well. So I hope you'll connect with this today as we think about what David's teaching us about our God through the 23rd Psalm. And really, the first verse says it all. Right out of the gate, David gives us the big idea about what this psalm, this song of worship, is all about. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing, or I shall not want. Wow. Now, you know, the, the, a lot of the newer versions today talk about I lack nothing in that last portion, but a lot of us memorized this growing up, if you grew up in the church, in the old King James Version, which is, I shall not want, right? Reminds me of the little girl who was in Sunday school, and she had just memorized the 23rd Psalm, and her, her Sunday school teacher's really proud of her, so she had her stand up in class, and she said, honey, well, why don't you just repeat the 23rd Psalm for all of us? The little girl stood up proudly, and she began, the Lord is my shepherd. He's all I want. <laughs> and that's really a lot of what David's talking about here. When we understand, friend, when we get what David is talking about for God to be the shepherd of our souls and our lives, then he truly becomes our sole desire. He becomes all we want in this life. So let's unpack this together. This first verse is really unpacked through the rest of the verses, the other five verses in this psalm. It, it gives us the depth and richness of what this first verse is talking about. So let's just unpack the first verse of this psalm together with that context. So David begins this way. He says, the Lord, the Lord. And when he's talking about the Lord, he's talking about the all-powerful God, right? So when David chooses this phrase to begin the psalm, the Lord, he is talking about the God of Israel, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is talking about the almighty God, the Lord. He's my shepherd. I don't have some weak shepherd. David's saying, the Lord, the almighty God of heaven and earth, he's my shepherd, the Lord. So he wants us to think about how powerful God is. And it really is incredible right as he starts this psalm to help us understand this. Because when you start a journey in life, you typically don't start the way the shepherd starts in this psalm. Verse 2 starts this way. He makes us lie down. In green pastures. Whoever starts a journey lying down. <laughs> well, David says our shepherd wants us to begin this journey by lying down. He wants us to, to lie down and look up to him and learn to rest in the fact, friend, that he is the almighty God. We're going to go through a lot of ups and downs. We're going to go th through some difficult terrain. We're going to face some deadly predators on this journey through life. 
And right out of the gate, David says, look, we need to remember the Lord is the almighty God. We need to lie down and rest in green pastures and look to him and be able to trust the fact that he is the shepherd of our souls and he can see us through whatever we face in this life. So we begin this journey understanding the Lord, the all-powerful God, is our shepherd. Sometimes it's hard to, to live that way, though, right? You know, we have a lot in common with sheep. That's why the Bible talks a lot about people as sheep, right? And one of the things we have in common with sheep is sheep are jumpy. They are edgy. I mean, they're like on edge all the time, anxious and worried. You know why? Because sheep are defenseless. You know, fluffy sheep, like, they can't defend themselves from the, the paw of the bear and the mouth of the lion, right? They're defenseless, so they're jumpy. They're on edge. They, they worry a lot. Sheep do. In fact, that's why sometimes like one sheep gets spooked, it'll take off running, and the rest of the sheep look around, they'll follow right behind it, and sometimes right over a cliff. That's, you know, that's where we understand that sheep get the reputation of not only being defenseless, but kind of dumb too, right? They'll follow each other right off a cliff because they're, they're anxious and worried. I, I don't know about you, but I, I know I have that characteristic in common with sheep. You know, I've done some pretty dumb things in my life. That's why the Bible says we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Right? So we have a lot in common with sheep. We're defenseless. So God wants us to understand that he is our all-powerful protector. Look, I don't know what has you running scared today, but my guess is almost every one of us in this room are a little worried about something, that there's something that causes us to stay up at night, you know, that we lose a little sleep over because our hearts are heavy, we're worried about something that's going on. Maybe it's a financial area, maybe it's over a child that you love, maybe it's, it's over a relationship, or maybe what's keeping you running scared is something going on at work or in your private life. Friends, I want to, want to remind you today that when you follow Jesus Christ as your shepherd, you don't need to walk through this life in fear because the almighty God has got you. Amen. He's got this, whatever it is that you're facing. So, you know, we, we came to Orlando December 21st. We moved here from northern Kentucky, which was my home area. We were serving a great church. Prior to going to that church, we had been in Atlanta, Georgia, where we planted a church that just went great guns. We thought we'd be there forever, but the Lord called us kind of back home to uh, my home in northern Kentucky, had a great ministry, and, and then it's in a big old church. And, and God laid it on our hearts for me to come to, to Lake Nona to plant this new church. And i got to be honest with you, like a lot of my friends and ministry colleagues are like, are you crazy, man? You're giving all this up to go start something new from scratch? Like, you've already done that. You've planted a church. Why would you ever do that again? You know, and they just couldn't get their minds around it. And like, well, when God calls you to do something, you better go. Right? So we're just following the shepherd to do what he's put on our heart. And I'll be honest with you, there are some mornings, my wife Ellie is over here with my daughter Lael, and I'm glad they could join us today. And, and there are sometimes some mornings, Ellie and I get up early, we have our coffee, and, and we get a little anxious, right? And we're thinking, okay, maybe our friends are right, man. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, it can be a little daunting, this task at times. And we don't know anybody. We're just getting immersed in this community. God, are you in this? Are you there? And it helps to remember how God has been faithful all through our lives. You know, it helps to look back and say he's been there if we want to draw strength to go forward at times, right? To remember he's the all-powerful God. He showed himself strong. And so one of the great things about how God's showing himself all-powerful in our context is just about every week, in fact, I've started to journal these things because every week since we've been there, God has revealed to us in one way or another that this is his thing, not our thing that he's in this, that he's, it's him that's birthing this new church, and he's just invited us into it, you know? And, and one of the most powerful ways he's done that already for us was right out of the gate in January, we went to the YMCA in Lake Nona, which is sort of the hub of the community there, and Ellie and I said, we want to sign up, and the lady at the front desk signed us up, and I said, look, I've got a nine-year-old daughter. She'd love to play basketball. We're from Kentucky. That's what we do, right? We play basketball, and I would love to coach, you know, I'd love to coach a basketball team, her team, if that's possible. And, and the lady looked at me. She was already, man, her face was downcast. She's like, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, they start this week. 
I don't think there's any more spots for basketball. And I'm like, man, this was a big part of my plan to get engaged in the community. I'm like, oh, really? Can you call the sports director? And she said, sure, I'll try. And she called him, and he's like, well, everything's filled up. We don't have any more spots. We start this week. And she's like, yeah, that's what I told him. And um, then, then he goes, well, wait a minute. We have one opening for second and third grade boys and girls. We need a coach. She goes, I think this guy's ready to coach. Is your daughter in second or third grade? I'm like, yep, she's a third grader. I said, can she play? He's like, yeah, no problem. If you coach, she can play. And boom, that was Tuesday. On Friday, we had our first practice. I'm like, man, God was opening a miraculous door. He was saying, this is my thing. I've got this. Trust me. Rest. I'm the all-powerful God. And I can take care of everything you need. And so he opened that door in the first practice, a little boy named Trevor. Got out on that floor with seven other kids. and I could tell immediately that something was wrong. Trevor was running pretty slowly, couldn't keep up with the other kids. The next practice, his mom, wonderful lady from South Africa, said to me, hey, will you keep an eye on Trevor? He's, um, his chemo's taking a real toll on his body right now. Seven years old. And... Uh, and I said, of course, of course. We later found out that Trevor contracted this rare form of cancer when he was just four years old and had been fighting this battle for three years. And uh, man, I'll tell you, right away I'm like, wow, God, not only did you open this door for us to coach, but you've opened the door and given me the privilege to be Trevor's coach. Wow, only God can do that when we trust him, friends. He wants us to know we can rest in him. Whatever you're facing, he's got this. He is the Lord, the almighty God. Now, the next thing David says is the Lord, the all-powerful God, is also my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He is not just an all-powerful God. He is such a personal God. He is an intimate God. He knows your every need. He knows your every dream, your every fear. He knows all there is to know about you. And he still loves you. That is our God. He is so personal and so intimate. I, I want to share with you, this is what the, the term shepherd really helps us to get. I, I want to share with you what George Smith wrote in the history, uh, the historical ge geography of the Holy Land. I don't know if you've ever read that one. But he's got a great quote that talks about the shepherd. Look, listen to what he says. I think it's in your notes if you're taking notes. He says, with us, sheep are often left to themselves. He's talking about in the West. We see sheep out there sometimes, but do you ever see a shepherd? <laughs> Never. He says, with us, sheep are often left to themselves. But I do not remember ever to have seen in the East a flock of sheep without a shepherd. In, in such a landscape as Judea, where a day's pasture is thinly scattered over an unfenced tract of country covered with delusive paths, still frequented by wild beasts and rolling off into the desert, the man and his character are indispensable. On some high moor, across which at night the hyenas howl, when you meet him, the shepherd, sleepless, far-sighted, weather-beaten, armed, leaning on his staff, and looking out over his scattered sheep, each one of them on his heart. You understand why the shepherd of Judea sprang to the forefront of his people's history, why they gave his name to their king, made him the symbol of providence, why Christ took him, the shepherd, as an example of self-sacrifice. God uses this beautiful picture of a shepherd to teach us his love for us, how much he cares for us. Man, I got this in such a powerful way in February. Had the chance to travel to Pakistan to be with a missionary friend of mine who is building a hospital to serve uh, people in poverty just outside of the city of Lahore, mostly Muslims, but also Christians. And uh, it's incredible. We dedicated the piece of ground that hospital is being built upon, and there were, there were government figures and the news media all covering this. It's a big deal because it's going to help people in a land where there's a lot of need for good medical care. In fact, Pakistan's like the only country left on earth that's still has polio. 
And so we're excited about partnering with uh, the, the work in Pakistan in this new hospital because in Lake Nona, where we're planting our church, it has this place called Medical City. And it's emerging as this great conglomerate of uh, education institutions and research institutions and hospitals that are working to maybe, it, with that synergy, find new breakthroughs in, in the field of medicine. And so I'm excited about maybe taking medical students and medical professionals over to Pakistan where they understand the need for medical care. They're doing mission trips and, and medical camps in this hospital, et cetera. So this is the connection, right, with Pakistan and, and our new church in Lake Nona. And so I was thrilled to get to go and be part of that. But then what Salim did, what just really blew me away, he said, we're going to call our new church the Good Shepherd Hospital. I want you to check this out. Like, here's a picture of, uh, of a lot of us on the stage that day at the dedication. If you'll notice, though, in the back, do you see that picture of Jesus with the lamb in his arms holding a staff? See that picture on the right side? That's the logo for the Good Shepherd Christian Hospital. Now, if you know anything about Muslim culture, you know that having uh, uh, any kind of image of Muhammad or any prophet like they would consider Jesus to be is taboo. Man, you don't do that. Not in that culture. You do not use pictures to represent the prophets. And so Salim has specifically chosen to use this picture of Jesus. You know why? He said, look, my people, they get that image. When they see a shepherd holding a lamb in his arms, he goes, I want people, whether they're Muslim or Hindu or Christian, whomever they may be, I want them to know that Jesus loves all wounded lambs and he will pick them up and care for them if they will let if they will follow him he will lead them even to eternal life he wants them to get that picture he says this picture i'm telling you it's taboo in the muslim religion but in my culture people are going to understand that image that's how powerful this picture of the shepherd is that he loves us that he cares for every sheep Every wounded lamb. I think um, the fourth verse of the psalm really brings this out. It, it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, he's with us. He is a personal God. He knows everything on your heart, every need that you have. He's there, even in the valleys of the shadow of death. Maybe you're walking through a valley today. I don't know how deep or dark it may be, but maybe you find yourself today in the middle of a valley. And you're wondering, God, are you still there? Do you know where I am? Do you know what's going on? Maybe it's the valley of depression. Maybe it's the valley of debt. Maybe it's the valley of addiction. Maybe it's the valley of loneliness. I don't know what valley you may be walking through today, friend. I don't know what it might be that's causing you to wonder, God, are you still there? But David writes this psalm to remind us, your God is your shepherd. He is a personal God. And he's still there, even in the deepest, darkest valley. You know, there, I, 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 there's a time, just a few years ago, that I walked through one of those valleys. We, we moved from Atlanta in the church we planted back home to my home, northern Kentucky. And my oldest daughter, Lydia, was, was a junior in high school when we moved. She did not want to leave the place she grew up and all the friends she had hoped to graduate with. At, as a junior in high school, it's pretty tough to make new friends in a new place. And it was a tough transition on her. She had a good attitude about it, but man, it was tough. And then just a few months into our move, the doctor said, you need to see an oncologist. He said, um, there's a problem. Wouldn't tell us what. We went to see the oncologist. The oncologist did the test and said, there is a growth in Lydia's abdomen about the size of a Nerf football squashed down. We believe it's cancerous. We're going to have to do surgery. Well, as a dad, you can imagine how crushed we were with that news. The last appointment before the surgery, I had to meet them at the cancer center. My wife, Ellie, and daughter, they, they drove there. I drove separately because I had this meeting afterwards. And we went there. We went through the, the appointment. The doctor told us what was going to happen and how important it was they get this out intact. And 
in the surgery and all. And um, I left there, and I got to tell you, friend, man, I, I was broken. I drove away from that cancer center on my way to the appointment on the interstate, driving 60 miles an hour and just weeping like a baby, just crying out to God. And I'm a preacher, but man, I was like, God, are you there? See, the valley can get us all, no matter who we are. When you walk through a valley, it can make any of us wonder, God, do you still know me? Do you still care, God? Are you still there? I'm like, why Lydia? We've put her through so much, Lord. We, you called us here, and she's been through so much in this transition. Why her? Why does she have to go through this? And, I, and I'm like, God, are you still with us? And I'm not kidding you. Right as I said those words, a big black bird fell out of the sky right in front of my car, <laughs> dead as a doornail, like a big, huge black bird just <laughs> drops out of the sky. I thought I was in a Monty Python movie or something. I'm just driving and this happened. And then immediately the Holy Spirit pressed into my heart the words of Jesus. Your father knows every time a bird falls to the ground. And how much more valuable are you than birds of the air? And God reminded me, yes, I know it's a deep valley. I know it's a dark valley. I know you're afraid of the valley of shadow of death, but I'm still here. If you'll turn around, you'll see me. I'm right here. I've never left your side. See, this is his promise in Hebrews 13. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's the faithfulness of our God, friends. As deep and dark as the valley may be, friend, I'm here to remind you today that your God is a personal shepherd. And it may feel like he's distant, but he's there. And you keep following him, and he's going to lead you through it. It's his promise. So God tells us through David that he's the Lord, the all-powerful. He's the Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. He's a personal God. He knows every need, every hurt, every pain in your life. And he's there to walk with you through whatever you're facing. And then he says this, I shall not want. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I will lack nothing. When we understand that God is our shepherd, he's all we want. See, the more we come to understand that he's got us, that he's got this, whatever we're facing, the more we can rest in him, the more we can follow him through whatever valley he leads us through because we know he's all we need and therefore he is all we want. The, the um, way this passage ends, so beautiful, so surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Friend, did you know, if he's got, do you believe this? Do you believe that he's leading you through your journey to life eternal in the house of God forever? Do you believe that Jesus has saved your soul? You talk about a shepherd. You know what the Bible says? This is Jesus. He said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's how much he loves you. He's a shepherd that gave his life for you. That's how much he loves you. You can't wander far enough for him not to come looking for you to find you. Jesus said, man, if there's a shepherd that has 100 sheep and one of them wanders, he will leave the 99, the open field, and he will go look for the one who has wandered. There is nothing too dangerous. There is no cliff too high. There is no valley too deep. There is no rocky crags too dangerous that he will not climb into looking for you. You might think, man, I've gone too far, Greg. No, you've not. You can't wander far enough for the Lord, our good shepherd. He will come looking for you until he finds you because he loves you that much. 
And when he finds you, if you'll let him, he'll pick you up in his arms. He'll put you on his shoulders. He'll take you back home. And he'll call all his friends. He'll say, hey, let's rejoice together. My sheep who is lost is now found. He'll walk into any danger. He faced down the danger of death and died for you. He faced down the danger of your sin. He took every one of them, every one of your sins on his back. He paid the price. That's how much he loves you. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Why? So he could lead you through this life to be with him forever. And if you believe that, folks, look, if he can take care of your eternity, what in the world is there here that he can't take care of? If he's got you for eternity, what is there today that he can't handle in your life? He has promised eternity so we can follow him with joy confidence and courage. I learned so much of that from Trevor. Courage. So Trevor began to get very ill toward the end of the season, so sick, in fact, he couldn't make our last game. Went back into the hospital shortly thereafter. The doctor said, there's no more we can do. This third time the cancer came back was too much, and they sent him home for hospice care. It was devastating, as you can imagine. I saw such courage in that kid. He never wanted to come out of the game. Even when he was so tired, he had the heart of a lion. And he fought so hard through this. In fact, I went to the hospital since he couldn't make the game. This is a picture of me giving Trevor his trophy. He just loves basketball. And so I gave him the trophy in, in the hospital. He, he loved getting it there. And what, what's so meaningful to me about this picture is just, just before this, his mom was talking to my wife, Ellie, and she said, what are you guys here for? Like, why'd you come here? And so we've been flying pretty low. Don't want to scare too many people away. Like, yeah, I'm a preacher, a church planter, you know. And, and uh, Ellie said, well, we're here to plant a church. She goes, really? She goes, well, we've lost our way with religion a bit. But when you start a Bible study, would you invite us to come? She goes, not for me. I'm really angry at God. I can understand. I mean, she said, I'm angry at God. For the last three years, I've seen so many children die of cancer. But I want you to invite us to come because I want Trevor to know that there is a God who loves him and he's got a home in heaven. Wow. There's the heart of a mother. Whatever she's working through, she wants her son to know God loves him. and has got a home for him in heaven. Trevor went to be with the Lord last Saturday. His funeral was yesterday. And uh, I've got to tell you, man, it's, it's a hole. I can't imagine for his family. But even for this coach, it's a hole. But that picture hangs in my office. And it will, as long as God gives me time and energy on this earth, because that picture reminds me that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm there for to help Trevor and thousands more kids and people like Trevor know that there is a home for them in heaven, that there is a shepherd who's a good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep, and he is willing to carry us through whatever we face all the way into eternity because of his love for us. Church, that's why we're here. There are Trevors all over. Wherever you're planted, there are Trevors. There are people that need the hope of Jesus, that need to know he loves them enough to give them a home in glory. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a fact if Jesus is your shepherd. So walk with courage, faith, hope, love, and carry that hope to everyone around you. Would you bow with me? Let's pray together. God, I just want to ask you for every person in this room right now, Lord. There are some people here that today need to remember. There are moms here that need to remember that you are the Lord. You are all powerful. You've got this because you've got them. Whatever they're facing, God, remind us today that you are the almighty God. We can rest in you. Some of us today need to remember that you're a personal God, that you are my shepherd. You're a personal God. You are with us, whatever we're facing. You're still there. Would you press into every heart today, Lord, reminding us right now, you are there. You will never leave us, 
never forsake us, however deep the valley may be. You are there. And Father, today, maybe there are others that just know, need to know that, that because you're there, because you're almighty, you've got all we need. You're our provider. You've provided eternity and forgiveness. We don't need to worry about anything today because you're all we need. Will you help us put you in the place in our hearts today that you are all we want, that we pursue after you with all of our hearts, our shepherd, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, who gave his life for us. Help us to sense his love today and to follow him wherever he leads. Until that day we step into glory in your house forever. In Jesus' name, amen.